It is my great pleasure to introduce Heather Martinez again to our group. Heather is a visual practitioner, art coach, and lettering artist living in Durango, Colorado. She's a member of Escribiente. Her presentation last fall was How to Letter Like a Sign Painter. Heather believes that what we write is more than mere handwriting. Letters are the building blocks of communication. Her graphic recording work has been featured in Letter Arts Review, where she was named an amanuensis to master calligrapher Mike Gold, a peak career experience that bridges the gap between her art and being a visual practitioner. So, Heather. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Elizabeth. It's not going to be the same presenting to you online as it is coming to um, New Mexico, but I'm really glad that we had an opportunity to do this tonight. And I'm excited to be um, covering what I call um, the value of palimpsest. And I'm going to share my screen now and just go through a few slides. So what is a palimpsest? And so I found out as I was doing some research for this, I've been saying it wrong for years. And so I put the phonetical spelling on the left of this slide and then the definition is it's a manuscript or piece of writing material in which the original writing has been effaced to make room for later writing, but which traces still remain. And some of you might actually have some experience either creating these or um, studying these, but we're going to make some, we're going to use it as a way to just as an exercise for practice. And it, it, they can turn out to be quite beautiful. And there's some things you that might inspire some other ideas for you. So really we're going to be making contemporary palimpsests and um, really creating letters on top of letters. And so this is something that can be reused or altered, but still bearing visible traces of its earlier form. And so this piece, uh, this is the Archimedes palimpsest. This actually had many authors and, and unknown works and original texts dating back to 5030 AD. And so what I want you to look closely at, because this has been re-imaged so that we can see several of the layers from just one of the, of the spreads, note how some of the text is going horizontally, and it looks as if the pages have been turned and then wrote, written again. So you've got 90 degree, you've got um, lettering at 90 degrees here. And if you'd like to, um, if we could have, uh, Mikhail is actually a tech host tonight, if you can put in the, um, in the chat, Mikhail, the link to the Archimedes uh, .org. This is a wonderful website. I've noticed that on the left side of the page, some of the links aren't working. So scroll to the bottom after you read it and click there. And there's a wonderful part about um, there's a wonderful part about how this was created. And uh, and I love. I was really struck by um, an imaging scientist, Roger Easton at RIT who, t who uncovered the Archimedes palimpsest because it was also, I think the last version of it, it was a prayer book who stated the manuscript has appeared at exactly the same time as the technology now available to read it. Had it appeared 10 years earlier, it may well have been Im imaged in a different way and would not have been successful and may have been forgotten. And I want to say this because I think it's really important as we research um, old works, ancient works, the pieces that came before us, that we are now in a time where we, we are the ones that are responsible for keeping this craft alive, right? And so we're it. Um, now, while I'm by no means putting myself uh, or expecting any one of you to work on parchment <laughs> or um, live up to the standards of being great mathematicians uh, that came before us. Um, I was really inspired by the idea that we are the ones that will keep each other interested by making meaningful marks. And so, again, I, I highly recommend that you do some research around this. I found it fascinating, and I just don't want to spend the whole time talking about history, but I do want to show you some ways that palimpsests have been used in art. This particular piece is done by a um, pressman by the name of Dan Garner. He was living in Colorado. I don't know if he's still there now. I've known him many, many years. And this is a two-color intaglio print. So I made a bit of a detail of the piece so that you can see that he was using found text 
burning that into intaglio plates, um, etching them into intaglio plates, and then he did a two-color intaglio. And so this is pretty modern. This was, it's about uh, 10 years ago that he gave this to me, and he told, and he, it's titled Palumpsest. And I was really shocked. Um, I'd never heard the word before. And I loved it so much. And at the time, I was the publisher of an art magazine. And um, right away, I thought, this is really beautiful. And my next issue of the magazine, I called Texture. And when I did a call for art, um, a wonderful calligrapher who you may know, one of our members, Louise Grunewald, sent me this image. And it ended up being the cover of the magazine that month. And what I love about it are the layers and layers of marks that she made. And she was one of my first um, teachers in art. At the time, I'd never, I've actually never learned any calligraphy from her, but she taught me some other processes and especially color. And I particularly love this piece and that one little orange speck where it looks like she's got all of these upward movements and then she comes back really fast and it was this piece that really inspired me when i became a calligrapher how can we make marks on top of marks on top of marks so i'm going to share my ipvo now but i just want to remind you what to have on hand and have plenty of paper because some of you might work slowly some of you might work quickly and you don't have to you're i'm going to give you a demo you don't have to follow along exactly but i do want to give you um some just some options so i'm going to be working with markers today you certainly don't have to work in markers but i do want to show you how i will be working i'm going to be working from large to small meaning my the nib sizes of my markers are going to be from big to little and i'll be using a brush marker and a wedge nib and a round nib and you are welcome to use whatever you like and if you notice here i'm also going to be going from light to dark so my yellow to my black and some in between colors as well and so i'd recommend the same uh, probably I'll, I'll use all five colors but you might want to use two or three if that's a little bit too much don't worry um, and then again you don't have to use markers you can use anything you have on hand but you're going to want to use an ink that layers well and probably dries fast all right Cool. So does math homework count? <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah, I think probably so. All right. So, oh, and a, just a quick reminder so that we can find it easily in the, um, in the chat. If you want to ask a question to me in the chat, I can see them, but it's a lot easier if you put three question marks and then ask your question. I can look up and I can see if there's any questions for me there. So starting with your largest um, nib or marker, whatever you're using, what I'd like you to do is we're just going to start at the upper left hand corner. We're going to go from left to right. And because it's been a bit since I've practiced, um, I've been traveling and spending some time taking care of my mom. You're just going to write really, really your largest, lightest words. And I'm looking at this going, oh, that's still pretty big. And I might rotate it going the other way. It's okay if some of my letters overlap. And this is really big to me. This is a 30 millimeter. So I might take a few sheets and just do my lightest color. That way I can get some, um, a few sheets going and let the ink dry. And you might also decide what lettering style do you wanna write in? Would you like to write all in the same lettering style, in different lettering styles? And again, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute. You'll notice, you'll say, hey, she's kind of writing like Neuland Hand, but it's four nib widths high. And as a graphic facilitator, someone who does large scale live graphic recordings, like what you saw at, um, at Seattle uh, Letters, I have to write really fast. So, I, and I'm writing with essentially what is a um, sponge on the end of a stick so <laughs> so we go so fast that I give my students permission to go four nib widths high for Neuland and I know many of you work so much slower so that's fine you don't have to go at my speed 
I'll look at that and go, yep, I don't think I'm going to be able to get my in in there. And I'm always challenged because whenever I get to the queue, I like to do more of a sign painter queue, but I'll be a little bit more traditional in this sense. And my S's are never quite like Rudolph's. In fact, I make them much wider when I'm working in person. So once you have your first layer down, this is where I would recommend turning your paper at a 90 degree and I'll grab that other sheet just because I like to have at least two going because it allows the ink to dry a little bit it's still a little damp we live here in the set for those of us in the southwest it dries really quickly doesn't it and then I would go to my next color and for this I'm going to choose a different uh, lettering style too because I want some contrast and I'm going to turn my paper And so why do this? I mean, yes, I talked a little bit about the historical. There's some really beautiful art pieces out there that can inspire us. But this is a way, I, maybe because I can get bored very easily, I thought, how can I practice my letters and make it fun? I've actually taken some of these and turned them into cards or gifts. And when the, um, when the pandemic first hit, I actually offered a, um, it was a lettering meditation sessions where people could dial in and I actually, we, we muted so no one could talk. I didn't allow sound for anyone and we just sat and lettered together. And this was the, one of the things that I did over and over and over. And it was a way to get a lot of beautiful letters and a lot of color all on one page. All right, looks like we have a question. How high should Noyland, there we go. Uh oh, someone was asking me privately. Yep, it's, it should be 3.5, but with a marker uh, and going fast, I let my, I tell my students you can go, you can go bigger if you want. So to many of you, right, seeing me write with a marker might be excruciatingly painful. <laughs> but really what I'm just offering here is how can we create, how can we make practice fun and interesting? Yeah. So bringing this back here, and again, going at that 90 degrees. And I hope some of you are writing some of these so that we can share after we're done here, see what you've created. And you don't just have to do ABC. You could certainly do a pangram. You could do names. It's a great opportunity to practice your uppercase, lowercase. This particular lettering style I call thick, thin script because it's made with a uh, 11 millimeter marker using the flat edge and then just this corner. And I'm flipping it. And the way I came up with this lettering style, I don't know if other people have ever done it before me, no one taught this to me, was when I had a student that said, I want to be able to make a brush letter look without having to change my marker. And they always used a, um, a wedge nib. And I thought, oh my gosh, how am I? That seems kind of lazy, but okay. And so I taught her this very mechanical way to make things look like brush lettering. So I based it on my brush lettering uh, form that I teach for 
graphic recorders. It's pretty legible. And I was using what I learned from Carol DuBosch on folded pen, because as you know, when you write with a folded pen, you write with the flat part, and then you write with the very, very corner. And so I just used that theory and thought, I wonder if we could do that, and it worked. And so I made an exemplar, and then I taught it to her. And by the time I taught it to her, she said, oh, well, I went ahead and I watched your brush lettering video, and it wasn't that hard. And I thought, okay, <laughs> that I came up with a new lettering, a new way to do lettering. And you'll see I'm pausing just like you would in, brush, in some brush letter forms um, and folded pen. You pause and flip and pause and flip. It's the same idea. So again, we'll go another 90 degrees. And I'll throw in this gray color and do it. And again, you can do the same lettering style or come up with a new one. And this is where you really start to get tested. So after I've got two layers down, I should probably really slow down and focus because, because we don't, I don't have the slant lines to work with, the slope lines, I'm sorry, the slope lines. Then I gotta get pretty creative about using my visualization powers to get it right. And I'm looking forward to taking Mike Gold's workshop in next month when we get to learn about brush lettering, more brush work. And Leanne, I'm glad you mentioned um, grids because I think, is it John Neal Books has a really nice grid paper that um, I've used it with marker before and you can still see the grid lines even after you've written on them. Oh, so the brand of marker that I'm using is called, it's actually called Neuland. It's spelled the same way as Neuland Hand. And it's a German marker. It's N-E-U-L-A-N-D. And these markers are great because they are um, refillable. They don't bleed through paper, though if I get a bunch of if I get a bunch of um, layers here, they probably will bleed. They don't bleed. The tips are replaceable and they're refillable. So some of these markers I've had for eight or nine years. So I'm just gonna go right to the next color because I don't have to go over this other gray. I'll just go in with Actually, I'll start with this blue and then I'll go to black. Oh, it feels like the marker nib has shifted on me. Because these nibs can be replaced, sometimes I don't put them all, I don't put them back in the exact same place. This one seems a little bit off to me, so I might have to choke up and not use the ergonomic grip. Another little thing is it's got a little nub in here. We call this the nose, and it keeps it keeps from the, the marker from rolling off the paper. I'm rolling off the table. Oh no, your paper isn't drying. Yeah, so if your paper isn't drying, it's probably good to have a whole stack full of papers just to have them um, available. Now, because I have a wedge nib, I certainly could try to do Neuland hand, but I don't really suggest that for my students because it's, this is so small, and usually at this size we're doing content. And so that happens to be something we have to write really fast. I mean, super fast, much faster than what I'm writing here. So, but what I really like about this blue, and I can do it with using thick, thin script, is I love how that blue lays over the, the red, orange, the yellow, and the white. And if you're working with inks that are light and then you go from light to dark, or if you're even just working in gray um, or some kind of a muted color that also um, happens to have, will layer well. It's kind of fun to see how you cover up some of the strokes. I think it was Amity Park's workshop where she was 
actually talking about Yves Le Term, where he said, sometimes some of your strokes will go over some of your other strokes, and that's called killing your darlings. And it's so hard sometimes because you might be looking at another letter going, oh, no, I don't want to cover that. Um, and so you either make room for it or if it's if you want it to be a part of your composition or sometimes you have to you have to kill your darling by covering it up. So I'm just going to stop there so we've got a little bit of room over here and I'll turn it again and then go for the black. This is a much faster, or can be, faster lettering style. I call this architect. When you go that fast, as you know, you tend to lose some of your form but also wanted you to just see what happens. This is, we've got one, two, three, four, five colors on top of each other, right? So another one that I think is pretty fun is, and I'll do this, it's uh, think about how you can use, if I were to do two color, how you could just use one color as a background and then maybe use parts of those letters to be guidelines for other letters. So what do I mean by that? I'm gonna write the word breathe, actually breath. And I wanted this to take up about half the page. Oops, I didn't mean to do that with the T. I didn't mean to go up that high. And then I'm going to flip it over and I'm going to have them meet in the middle so I can imagine myself, um, you know, if you could do this on a computer, you could just take a word and then flip it or mirror it. Do a slightly different R this time. It's okay because this is all going to get covered up. What I do like about working with markers is it allows me to go much faster. And then you can find a rhythm in it. And now, looking at the lines that we have here, the thicks and the thins, just looking, I think I like it this way better. Then I'm gonna go in with a different color. Let's see if I find. I'm just going to write a poem, but I'm going to be thinking about these lines that are here almost like waves. I'm going to cut right off of this for just a second. So I'm going to imagine some lines here. And just do sort of a mono line script.
you have a question, you want to unmute yourself, go ahead. Oops, I have a, don't we always just mess up with the spelling? I meant to put to stop time when something, I won't start over here. I did it again. So I held my breath as we do sometimes to stop time when something wonderful has touched us. And so this is a quote by Mary Oliver. Oh, do the icons always show up in my screen when I use visualizer? No, I'm sorry. I should have clicked that. All I did was click that little, the screen. So I apologize for all that distraction. Yep, there we go. All right. I think someone was asking me that privately. Thank you for <laughs> showing me that. So that is an example of, now I did these very, very quickly, uh, but I wanted to show these to you just so that you have an activity, a practice, a way of practicing um, that you might find helpful, at least keep practice interesting and playing with how do words play in relationship to each other. So I'll stop sharing for just a moment here. And I'm curious if anybody created anything. And if you can sh hold it up without it dripping, I know some of you might have some wet ink, but hold it up for a little bit. Yeah, I got to flip through all these windows. Oh, nice, Sharon. Oh, thanks, Ron and Evelyn. Awesome. Any more? Susie, thank you. Great. Thank you, Trish. All right. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Great. So, so I did several, I did five color and then two color. And this is just working on letter size paper. So um, originally I did them on very big pieces of paper um, behind me. I don't know if you see it, but there, this is acrylic on what's a pin board paper. It's actually, let's see. It's this here. So it's about um, two and a half feet wide by about four feet tall. And the, I think the image that went out um, and that's on the website is, is that piece. Um, it's done on a brown, on a brown uh, craft, like craft paper. So yeah, so usually I write really, really large. Yep. And then I want to show you, um, let's see. I wanted to show you a few others that I've created as well. So let me share the screen. So this is a piece that I did, and this was on a flip chart. So if any of you have been, in, remember meetings when we'd have flip chart paper? So this is where I've done a lot of my lettering styles. You'll see uh, five different lettering styles here. Actually, there may be more in there. And I was using those same markers that I just showed you, that really large 30 millimeter, and then uh, about a 10, millimeter and then the brush nib and then the wedge nib and then the round nib so those are all on one sheet and then another thing that i like to do is to do acrylic on canvas and so i um, custom mixed some inks and this is a flat high flow ink and um, neuland also has acrylic markers that they um, produce as well so i bought some empty acrylic markers and some of their acrylic ink and mix those up and did those in there as well. And I think the really large yellow in the back was done um, not with a 30 millimeter, but with a 50 millimeter. Yeah, it was, it was a much bigger one. 
and then all of the other sizes were actually done with this. It's about a 10 millimeter and I was using either the wide side or the very thin side. So that red is really thin. So let me show you what that would look like. And I'll stop sharing. So I created, I know that looked like a tablecloth, but it was actually just a table that I was working on. And then I made some bags to put some of my, um, because I'm a visual practitioner, some of my pin board parts in. So I have this big pin board and what it is, it's, it's like a big wall and um, you can put paper on it. And that's what I graphic record on. Well, it has legs and some other parts. So I made bags and I didn't want to just make plain canvas bags. So I put letters on them and then I had some extra fabric left over. So I made some, I made some uh, pencil bags with them. So ironed them a lot so these can be washed and it just makes for a really nice texture as well. Yeah, I, you know, I thought about making masks as well. I don't know, I think it's okay after you wash it a couple of times. There aren't any fumes, I don't believe, in acrylic. But yeah, I think making masks would be great. Have you tried that? Has anybody tried that? So Mikkel is asking, can you fill the acrylic markers with any kind of paint? Well, yes and no. So when people ask me, can you fill Neuland markers with any kind of paint? Because it's a marker and what's inside is a little, um, let's see if I can get this to come out. Yeah. So it's like a little plastic covered um, cotton coating. Like this is like a little cotton insert with a little plastic around it. If it'll go, th my general rule for these kind of markers is if it will go through a um, fountain pen and won't get clogged up in a regular nib, then it can go through your marker. But for the, um, for the acrylic markers, I would say it needs something with a little bit, um, it's got to be thicker like acrylic, but these are high flow acrylics. So you can buy high flow acrylics from, um, if you can imagine, or if you've used Golden, they have a high flow acrylic. And Neuland's high flow acrylics um, are very similar. They're very, very thin. It's, it's pretty watered down. It's not as thin as any of our other inks. And it's, it comes with this um, little tip on it, which you can draw with as well. So, but it's just a, a high flow ink. I don't know that I would put any other um, kinds of inks in it, but generally, as long as it doesn't have any kind of shellac in it, I've put, um, calligraphy inks, um, Windsor Newton. I've put a lot of walnut inks through these bigger ones. And these are made for acrylic as well. Um, I just don't know how these particular ones do. But yeah. All right. What other questions do you have? Leanne's saying she wouldn't want to breathe through acrylic paint. And yeah, it's, a, it's like a plastic polymer, but I'm not sure um, how that is. Print it via spoon flour, yep, onto cotton. And so I've done that as well. And I don't know if I have a slide of that readily, but um, I actually have a, a, a um, pattern that I have printed in spoon flour and I have, um, that it's all letters. So yeah. Yep, fabric, fabric markers might work. Um, I don't know if fa all fabric markers are non-toxic. So you might check to see the toxicity level in whatever you're using, if you're going to use it on a mask. But fabric markers would definitely work on fabric, and you can do all kinds of lettering. And one question was, how many layers do I usually do? And when I'm practicing, I just fill up the sheet because I'm really, it's meditative, I'm getting warmed up. Um, and so in this case, I had one, two, three, four, five layers. Um, sometimes I'm just practicing maybe a layout. And so I might just do two to three layers and then I might change my tools, go to a different piece of paper. And this, this I would consider like a thumbnail sketch and then go to something else. Um, I know some people say always practice on your really good paper, but I'm saying this is just for like a warm up kind of thing. So any other questions about this? Again, it's really just a practice piece. Uh, you can certainly make beautiful works of art, but um, that's not what the intention for here today was. Is your ink indelible? This ink is not. This is water-based uh, ink, but it's not indelible. There is the black that I was using is. Um, imagine it's like a Sharpie marker, only it doesn't smell, so it has a bit of more of a plastic polymer in it, and um, so it dries very quickly. So that's the one color that I can go over other colors with, or I can put other colors over it without it smearing. Yep. Have you Do ever I tried? What's that? Have you tried washing it off? 
No, but that would be the next level, wouldn't it? Um, it might be kind of fun to, to experiment with different types of materials. What can we wash off or scrape off and go back and do that again? Yeah, I can imagine. They did it then because they didn't have a lot of supplies. And so mm -hmm. if they were working on parchment or, pel or vellum, that was the only sheet they had. Um, and working on like a, a larger type of piece or maybe something more, you know, more permanent, I guess, than a practice piece. Have you ever tried like gesso or anything, you know, a, a thin layer of gesso to kind yeah. of mask yeah. a bit or? I have. I've actually, um, gesso is a great thing to use, putting gesso over, or sometimes I'll put um, acrylic or gesso on, on one sheet of paper or both sheets of paper and then put them together and then peel them apart. And sometimes I like to see the transfer of um, the other pages come apart. Sometimes I do it with existing old books and then letter on top of that. Didn't really show all of those tonight because I was like, oh, this will just be a quick, you know, fun activity. But um, yeah, you certainly could. And gesso is really fun to work with, especially if you layer it really thin. I sometimes put it on with a, like a scraper. So it's really thin. Great question. Do I uh, do you ever write on both sides of a transparent sheet? That would be a lot of fun is to find a way to do on transparency or a transparent sheet, maybe with acrylic um, should stick. Yeah. Yes. So Trish Meyer, she's uh, referring to something that some people call sync art, write with India ink and um, it will wash off leaving an interesting black remains. And if it's slightly wet, some, sometimes it'll smear a little bit. Yep, and Sumi as well. Yeah, and vellum will definitely work. Yep. Great, and so it looks like Mikkel's reminding us that up in the chat, Elizabeth put a link uh, in the chat earlier to one of her books using Palimpsest on paste paper. Wonderful, well, now we're all gonna want you to teach that, Elizabeth. So um, do we want to take a, a bit of a, just a short five minute bio break and then go into announcements or are we good to go? I'm going to let this be up to Elizabeth. Oh, you're muted. I would hand the meeting over to Beth House now. Okay. Who's our chairperson. All right. But thank you. But first I'd like to thank you very much for leading us in this fun activity you're um, welcome oh thanks for the claps and also i want to remind everybody that next month in case you do have to drop off for some reason next month we're going to have mikkel she's going to be showing us blind contour alphabet book <laughs> 